vassals of government, we must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. In Dallas, Texas, three shots were fired at President Kennedy's motorcade in downtown Dallas. The first reports say that President Kennedy has been seriously wounded by this shooting. It is a big idea. A new world order. It was almost as if it were a planned implosion. It just pancakes. Either you are with us, or you are with the terrorists. But I also believe that a lot of gun owners would agree that AK-47s belong in the hands of soldiers, not in the hands of criminals. Guns will be taken, and no one will be able to be armed. We will take all guns. For many of the police and guard troops, it is an uncomfortable job to do this in an American city. It's global governance at last. Is it one world? The central bankers in charge. But aren't we all just living and dying for what the central banks do? Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm David Knight. It's Tuesday, January the 15th, 2013. So, the military's been conducting extensive weather modification programs since the Vietnam War. And we have a UN treaty signed in 1977 agreeing not to use weather modification as a weapon. We have persistent aviation contrails increasing cloud cover with consequences for climate and agriculture. And we're seeing levels of aluminum soaring in soil and water samples. Governments and others are actively modifying the weather, while George Soros and the mainstream media are telling us that the changes in the weather aren't due to sun cycles or deliberate modification, but due to our lifestyle. Sending money to global financiers like Al Gore and Soros in the form of carbon credits or creating a global tax will somehow solve the problem, if there is a problem. Mark Twain said, everybody talks about the weather, but nobody does anything about it. If only that were true today. So we've got on the line here Rosalind Peterson, and she's been following this for quite some time, looking at contrails and their effects on the weather. Welcome, Rosalind. Well, thank you very much for having me as a guest on your show today. Thank you. Uh, you know, you've been following this for quite some time, and, and you've been watching the skies. You've got an organization, uh, it's uh, California Sky Watch, and also another one called Agriculture Defense Coalition. Tell us how you got into this. Well, back in 2002, 10 years ago, I began to notice, um, since my background is in agriculture, that um, our skies were being covered over in white haze and persistent jet contrails. And in 2002, it was so obvious uh, here in Northern California where I lived that you couldn't miss it. So I started doing research to find out um, what was going on, uh, impacts that this man-made cloud cover would have. And uh, over the last 10 years, I've put about 40,000 documents on my websites documenting what is going on, uh, government reports, um, all kinds of um, university studies, whatever I could find on the topic. Yeah, you've got quite a bit of information there. You know, one of the things I think came out of this conference that I watched is we sat through quite a bit of, quite a few presentations. It seems to me like the science is, is pretty unsettled uh, as to what they really, they're doing some things, obviously they're doing things, and we're seeing some effects. Uh, and it seems like there's kind of, uh, well, let's throw this up and, and see what happens kind of effect. Uh, the fellow who was talking about uh, climate engineering, uh, he was trying to do some things with uh, aerosols. It was what he was proposing that would uh, stop cirrus cloud formation because he believed that that was going to have a net warming effect. But the very first guy in the question and answer period that got up questioned that and said, well, you know, cirrus clouds at a lower level actually have a net cooling effect. So they're not agreed as to uh, what the, the effects are, uh, and yet, you know, they, they do their computer models and then they uh, put the stuff up in the sky. Um, I thought it was kind of interesting, uh, one of the articles that, that uh, you sent to me, they talked about how there was a net warming in the three days that uh, all the jets were grounded following September 11th, back in 2001. Um, yes, but what they did is they took um, an average temperatures, and so when they talk about there was a warming, um, 
they weren't, um, in other words, they didn't give you all of the data that was found, I don't think, in that report. Mm -hmm. So therefore, I have some questions because um, um, scientists at NASA found that cirrus clouds formed by contrails from jet aircraft exhaust uh, which contain water vapor, uh, potent greenhouse gas, are capable of increasing average surface temperatures enough to account for a warming trend in the United States that occurred between 1975 and 1994. So there is, uh, because of this man-made cloud cover, which is a form of geoengineering, because it reduces the amount of direct sunlight reaching the Earth, but also traps heat, which warms us at nighttime as well as may have a little cooling effect during the day, but it still traps heat. And we're concerned about this um, because we feel that uh, water vapor as an issue has not been discussed mm -hmm. uh, by any of the scientists or um, in any of the hearings that have been held on the subject of geoengineering by the U.S. House um, Science and Technology Committee. Yeah, and along those lines, there were just news had just broken while we were at the uh, AMS convention that uh, they had just gone through and had the uh, weather figures for 2012 and said it was, uh, I think it was the warmest uh, uh, year they'd had on record or the warmest in quite some time, uh, you know, in, in uh, North America. But overall, uh, it was only the seventh or eighth warmest uh, globally because in other places there was cooling. So if they're putting a cloud cover that is raising the temperature over the United States, then that's something that could cause us to have warming here with their measurements, but perhaps, uh, you know, not a global warming because that's not being done everywhere. Is that, is that the way you see it? Or? Well, that's the way I see it. And also, you have to look at um, a Stanford University report by Jacobson uh, Professor Jacobson has noted that aircraft, aviation, and contrails um, are responsible for a good percentage of the warming over the Arctic and Alaska regions, mm -hmm. and that the contrails from these, uh, which is mostly water vapor and the man-made clouds they produce, are warming this area, and no one talks about this in the news. Mm. And I put this on my Alaska section of the website so people could look at the data and see what was going on there with the warming in the Arctic and Alaska. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, are you concerned at all uh, when you're watching this? Are you noticing things? Some people have said that they've seen uh, soaring concentrations of aluminum and barium and other things like that in the uh, soil and water. Have you noticed that with your agricultural uh, uh, watches out there? Well, uh, the California State Department of Health Drinking Water Division, I obtained all of their drinking water data for going back to the 1980s. And you can tell in state drinking water testing, uh, which is uh, done by uh, private, it's not done by private citizens, it's done by water districts. Um, it's, it's, their testing reveals that there is a definite increase statewide in aluminum and barium magnesium um, and other contaminants in drinking water since the 1990s. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was a, in one of the uh, presentations, uh, they were doing some, uh, some testing. They did computer simulation and modeling, trying to determine when, if the computer could predict the right cloud conditions that would be optimal for their cloud seeding operation. And uh, so they were putting up... Uh, uh, silver iodide, and uh, they put up a couple of trace radioactive elements, indium and cesium, and then he said they were going to test for those to see uh, where they were coming back down, see what the, the rain pattern was going to be. But he also mentioned casually aluminum, and I really wanted to ask him about that, but uh, I, I, you know, it was in the same session where the fellow was that was talking about climate engineering, so we went for him first and, and we lost the other guy, but uh, yeah, most of the most of what we're seeing uh, as far as, uh, uh, you know, climate change and that sort of thing, that any talk about that, that was pretty much under the radar at, uh, at AMS. Um, I guess one of the things that uh, struck me was um, just, just the sheer quantity of, of work that's being done everywhere. And it seems like it's focused primarily here in the United States and in uh, China. Have you noticed anything in terms of uh, uh, increased cloud cover in China? Or you, is that anything that you monitor? 
Um, I do a little, but you did notice uh, the the cloud cover and the jet contrails during the Olympics when it was held in China. And so there was some background where you could see um, in the skies, you could see the contrails in the skies. So we know that um, contrails that persist exist in other countries as well as the United States, especially the NATO countries. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, one of the things uh, we always want to do is follow the money. And uh, some of the stuff that you sent me, I mean, everybody's heard of uh, carbon credits that uh, are going to go to private companies like the ones that Al Gore runs that make them wealthy. Uh, we've also got uh, carbon taxes, which uh, could be uh, a way to fund a global government because they have to do that globally. Uh, but you also pointed out that there's weather derivatives. That was something that was new. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Yes. Um, the Chicago Mercantile Stock Exchange has been allowing betting on the weather for some time. And then in the last couple of years, they have decided that they're going to allow betting on the weather, whether how much snow, how much rainfall, um, all kinds of betting. And one of the things that we know is that there are 66 ongoing weather modification programs ongoing in the United States and that these programs are successful, that they're used every year. Pacific Gas and Electric Company, a public utility in California, has been doing it for over 40 years here in California. It's just one example. But in Wyoming and Colorado, Texas, there's been weather modification programs ongoing for years, and that these, um, they're, when they say that there's indefinite information and we don't know how well it works, we have to realize that this has been perfected over time, especially considering that we, the U.S. Air Force perfected it in the Vietnam War. Mm -hmm. uh, they were doing weather modification there on a massive scale, and they know that it worked because they perfected the technologies then. Yeah, so they, we even have a document going back to... Uh... 1977, this is from the U.S. State Department, uh, Convention on the Prohibition of Military or Any Other Hostile Use of Environmental Modification Techniques. Uh, this is something that uh, came out of the State Department, um, uh, went to the U.N., and so uh, they, they were aware of it uh, to the degree that they wanted to have treaties uh, prohibiting using it as a weapon. But there's nothing there that keeps them from uh, using that here domestically, is there? Well, um, y yes, because the United States passed it, ratified it, and passed it. So it is, uh, the Enmon Treaty has been ratified by the United States, and because of our wartime activities in Vietnam, about using weather modification for warfare. However, um, if you say that something is experimental, or if you say that it isn't ongoing, it's one-time research and testing, then anyone can modify or change the weather in the United States without public um, notification, public oversight, without your elected officials knowing what's going on. So we need to really be aware that there's no laws preventing atmospheric manipulation of any kind right now mm -hmm. um, in the United States. And we've had uh, people like Bill Gates and uh, uh, others who have talked about ma massively dumping quantities of particulates into the atmosphere in order to do something that, uh, according to their computer models, they hope will uh, have a beneficial effect in terms of uh, you know, cooling or something like that. Uh, but there's really, as you said, there's not really anything that's going, they don't have to notify the public. There isn't any agency that really oversees that, is there? No, there isn't. Um, if you have an ongoing weather modification program, you do have to report to NOAA, and I sent you that NOAA list of weather modification programs, mm -hmm. which is online, mm -hmm. uh, which they do on a yearly basis. But we're talking about, um, in other words, David Keith, for example, is talking about putting aluminum oxide uh, particulates in the air to reduce the amount of direct sunlight reaching the earth, mm -hmm. using water vapor as a medium, mm -hmm. uh, which is a greenhouse gas, which doesn't make any sense because you'd be adding more greenhouse gases uh, via aviation to the atmosphere. Exactly. Um, so we're talking about that. We're also talking about putting salt particles up. This was Bill Gates was going to be funding this. Um, in other words, looking to the skies to whiten the clouds to reflect more direct sunlight away from the earth. But here's your problem. 
when you start putting up particles and chemicals, not only do you have an air, soil, and water pollution problem, but you reduce the amount of direct sunlight reaching the earth and you have a photosynthesis problem mm -hmm. because all plants require direct sunlight to grow healthy and strong and produce crops for trees to grow strong and healthy. You also reduce the amount of vitamin D absorbed through our skin, which means increasing health effects. You lower solar panel power production when you start to add man-made clouds and haze and you start to put up things that brighten the clouds to reflect more direct sunlight, you are going to have an impact on the Earth's climate and weather system and our natural resources, as well as human health, crop production, and other um, items that need to be really discussed by the public, and they're not being discussed at this time. Yeah, it's amazing to me that... Uh you know, both as government policy and also uh, the EPA, for example. I mean, the, the things that, that most of their regulations are centering on, where they're shutting down businesses and that sort of thing, is, is to reduce uh, CO2 and to reduce, even more so, to reduce particulate matter. I mean, they focused on that more than they have CO2 reduction. And yet, here you've got at the same time uh, these organizations uh, proposing and, and in many cases actually doing it, dumping massive amounts of particulates and uh, greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, as you point out. I mean, at the one hand, they're, they're, they're cracking down on individual users, and yet they're doing it at the same time. And then telling us that in order to protect us from this global warming that we're causing, uh, they're setting up these uh, massive global schemes to make money, like the carbon credit exchange, the uh, carbon taxes, that sort of thing, and even uh, you know, betting on it as far as derivatives. That's right, because when you put a program into place and it's known, like the weather modification programs going on um, in the United States, there's 66, you can bet on those. You can bet that in Colorado or Wyoming they're going to enhance the snow in certain areas, and you can bet on that, make fortune. Yeah, exactly. It's That's insider what... trading, isn't it? It's just like uh, what we see yeah. the Congress doing all the time and, and doing it with impunity, saying, yeah, we're allowed to do insider trading. Well, they're essentially doing insider trading with this and setting up, uh, a system to basically alarm us into a, a world government organization or to to create kind of a Federal Reserve on a on a global level, you know, which is what the way I see this carbon credit uh, scheme going. Well, the carbon tax that they're proposing is not what what is what is that tax going to do? It can't stop consumption because you don't have alternatives mm -hmm. uh, in place. Um, so they're going to tax us and then they're going to use the funds for something else. And exactly. I object to that. And they don't say how a carbon tax on all of us is going to, um, in other words, help with the climate, reduce global warming. They're not talking about reducing the uh, water vapor produced by um, aviation. Mm -hmm. They're not talking about water vapor as, as being a problem, that they could reduce this. Mm -hmm. uh, in other words, they, they have these schemes. And the interesting thing about geoengineering or the part of it, solar radiation management, which means reducing the amount of direct sunlight reaching the earth, is that these schemes would be funded, but when you ask the people promoting them, a small, click, a small group of men who really promote this, like David Keith, for example, or Ken Caldera, um, they say, well, once you start, you could never stop because it doesn't fix the problem, it just masks the warming. Yeah, yeah. It sounds and like, that's incredible. Sounds like the cancer industry. <laughs> yeah, they don't ever come up with a cure, but they just endlessly treat it with, uh, you know, more and more expensive treatments. Yes, and they say, well, then you can't stop. Well, when I say, well, you're going to do something in our atmosphere and you can't stop because then things will get worse. Well, the the programs that they're promoting are going to make things worse, air pollution, water pollution, soil pollution, human health problems, all kinds of things. Those are going to get worse. And then they say, well, we can't stop because then, you know, crisis will prevail. Well, this doesn't seem like a, a long-term, long-lasting solution. Yeah, exactly. And, and I think one of the things that uh, really disturbed me, of course, a lot of the people that we saw doing presentations, there were many, many presentations because uh, – each person's presentation only lasted uh, 15 minutes, and uh, they were doing these uh, the entire day for four or five days.
but uh, they're typically going in with a thesis and uh, doing something small, local, experimental. Now, most of the meteorologists were, were doing computer simulations, and then they were going out and, and taking measurements, getting empirical data, that sort of thing, and trying to close the loop. But when we're talking about massive things like climate change, they're not able to do that. The climatologists are different from the meteorologists. The, the uh, climatologists are, are looking at uh, things that are stretching out over decades or centuries or even millennia. And the way they're doing that is they're making, uh, they're modeling things and they're doing computer projections. And, and so, you know, their understanding and how good their model is, is uh, not anything that we can really verify. So I, I guess the, one of the concerns that I have is that they're, they're talking about doing things and, and are doing things that they really don't understand what the consequences are. No, and they're very focused on one thing. They're not focused in the agriculture field and impacts or tree mm -hmm. health or photosynthesis. They're not interested in solar panel power production and that and and then their models don't help with those things. So and when they say models, they never usually put aviation impacts into models. Mm -hmm. See, the models can be flawed, and unless you know what parameters are excluded or if they're taking averages and excluding things, exactly. then you can never verify that their models are correct. Exactly. And as we watch them do this, I mean, even when they were doing relatively small contained experiments where they're doing cloud seeding uh, over an area, for example, maybe during the snow season, uh, and they're going out, they're measuring it constantly over two or three months and, and trying to close that loop. Even then, they have a hard time modeling it. And so, as you said, you know, when they've got, when they're trying to model, and, and the fellow that we talked to from the uh, uh, National Center for Atmospheric Research, uh, he was very honest about the limitations of uh, computer models. And um, I think he was very skeptical about trying to do any kind of climate engineering and, and also the massive environmental impacts he mentioned of, uh, that, that would have to be considered if, if you were to do climate engineering. But when you look at what they're trying to do with just a local controlled experiment uh, and see how difficult that is for them to model because they're out in the real world. Like I mentioned to him, my background is electrical engineering. You're, you're modeling something, if you do a computer simulation of electrical circuit, you're doing something that's very well known, that's there in the laboratory, that, that uh, you know, it doesn't have the kind of infinite variables that the, uh, uh, the environment does. And uh, as you said, they're not even looking at uh, contrails and uh, clouds uh, that are coming, that are persistent from uh, contrails that are being generated by aviation. Yes. So uh, the thing is that when they look at their models, they look at a very small, like you said, they look at a very small detail and then say this or that about it. But uh, what we're finding is they don't look at the overall picture. Mm -hmm. In other words, they, they, since, the, since agriculture, which is my background, and I worked for the U.S. Uh, Department of Agriculture here in California for many years under the Farm Service Agency, what happens is that they have no knowledge of water pollution, soil pollution, changing local climate. They have really no knowledge, and they can't put it into their models because the microclimates are hundreds of thousands because each city and each town, each area has a different microclimate that they use that agriculture depends upon. Mm -hmm. And you start changing those, they have no idea what impact that's going to have um, to the next door neighbors. Yes. Um, and, and so there's one other thing I want to say about that. Mm -hmm. One of the things that has been noted is that you can enhance the snow or the rainfall in one area, but they're not studying the, the, the nearby areas that go into drought because their normal rainfall or mm -hmm. snow never gets to them. Very good point. Yeah, yeah. They're robbing from Peter to pay Paul. Yeah, so they look at one little thing that, oh, well, it worked or it didn't work or, or whatever they see, and they model it, but they, but they aren't looking at the overall picture to see what's happening downstream. Well, one last question I had for you, which was, uh, you know, most of the stuff that they're doing is silver iodide. Uh, they did talk about, uh, I think it was bismuth uh, triiodide uh, was another particle that they were looking at for their cloud seeding stuff. Nobody would say they were doing anything with uh, uh, aluminum, uh, but do you have, looking at it from an agricultural standpoint, I mean, do you have any concerns about silver iodide? Well, it depends on the amount and the scope that they're using, mm -hmm. and it can have its impacts because it rains out. And there is some 
uh, EPA documentation that shows that silver iodide, uh, in other words, can have some negative effects, and that's on the California EPA website. Okay. Anyone can look it up. What I'm concerned about is that it isn't just silver iodide. It's salt, uh, sea salt mm -hmm. is being used for cloud seeding purposes. Right, hygroscopic, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there's ground-based Mm -hmm. um, uh, cloud seeding. There's not just small aircraft cloud seeding, there's ground-based cloud seeding. Yes. So you have a tremendous amount of methods and techniques going on, and I list some of them on the uh, weather modification uh, section of my website, mm -hmm. so that people can go and look at that, and they can see the various techniques and chemicals and different things that are used, and it's stunning. Yeah, yeah. Your website has a wealth of information. I, I've got to say, you must have sent me about uh, 30 or 40 uh, uh, emails, and uh, each of them had uh, multiple documents on there. I mean, and that's just a small fraction of, what, of the data that you've collected over the years. I would highly recommend anybody that wants to look into this and is wondering about, uh, you know, the massive uh, uh, contrails that they see in the sky crisscrossing, uh, go to agriculturedefensecoalition.org. Uh, they're going to find a lot of information there. Also, California Skywatch. Is that uh, .org or is that .com? That's .org, right? It's No, California Skywatch.com okay. and agriculturedefensecoalition.org. If you click on the category section of either one, it will give you an alphabetical listing of everything on the websites by topic. Great. Thank you very much. And that's the thing, you know, at this point, we need to educate ourselves about uh, what's being done because uh, they're not telling us about it. Uh, most of what they're doing with the weather is under the radar at this point. So, uh, but you can find out what's going on. If you go to these sites, uh, uh, Rosalind Peterson and her organization has a wealth of information there. Well, thank you very much, Rosalind, for talking to us. Well, thank you very much, and it's been an honor and privilege to be on your show today. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Well, if you want to know more about uh, ground particulates and, and uh, things that are coming out of these geoengineering projects or why they're doing it, there's an excellent couple of documentaries. What in the world are they spraying and why in the world are they spraying? We have those available at InfoWars store. Uh, we have a chemtrail combo where you can get both of those for $34.90. Uh, very good documentaries. They go over... Uh, uh, exactly what people are seeing and, and uh, in terms of the concentrations of aluminum and barium and other uh, elements that are part of these geoengineering programs. And they also look at uh, why they're doing this. Uh, because there's a lot of evidence, there's a lot of documents that uh, uh, the globalists have come out with uh, why, they're, why they're doing this. Just as we talked to Rosalind Peterson, you know, a lot of people don't really even take a look at what's going on above the sky. They don't look in they, they might see things happening with the weather, they might see things happening with agriculture, but they don't stop to ask why. We want to do that. And I think uh, if you're watching this, you're probably the kind of person who wants to do that. Try to get your friends to be that kind of person, to uh, look behind what's actually happening to them, to be aware of what's actually happening around the world, politically, chemically, uh, in terms of uh, weather, you know, and, and get the bigger picture. Well, that's it for tonight. We'll be back tomorrow night at 7 o'clock Central Time. I'm David Knight.